Right, first, just a quick nitpick. It's not just code quality, it's software quality, which I believe is a broader term and encompasses more of the total picture. There's a lot of things that go into software quality that can be noticed by people who would never get to see the code or wouldn't know high or low quality code from the opposite. So anyway, hello Arlington, I'm Dave Aronson, the T-Rex of Codosaurus. And I flew down here from Fairfax to tell you all about my definition of software quality. But why? I'm pretty sure we'd all agree that code quality, excuse me, software quality, uh, you got me thinking code quality, Casey. Software quality is a good thing. We want a lot of it in the software we use, but more importantly for this crowd in the software we create. But if we don't have a good definition of software quality, preferably something very applicable and easy to remember, then it's very difficult to achieve it. And if we don't share that definition with somebody else, then it's going to be very difficult to convince them that we have in fact achieved it. So I'm basically trying to get everybody on the same page. Yeah, good luck with that. Several years ago, I was looking for a good definition of software quality and I found several, but they all had some pretty serious problems. Most of them were long lists of complicated terms full of developer jargon, which is okay when we're talking amongst ourselves, but I wanted something that even non-technical people would understand so they'd understand our challenges better and be able to give us more precise feedback on exactly how our software sucks. <laughs> Some of the definitions were proprietary, making us buy expensive software tools or at least relatively expensive documents, like from the ITU, and ISO, and so on. Don't get me started on those. Some of them were only applicable within the context of particular styles, like particularly object-oriented programming, or within certain technologies, usually, of course, also proprietary. And I felt all of that was just plain wrong. I wanted something that everybody could use for free. Some of the definitions were only about issues of concern to us developers, which, okay, you might be okay with that, but I wanted something that would take into account the needs of the users and all the other categories of stakeholders. And some weren't even about the software at all, but more about the byproducts or the process, like the, saying you have to hold particular meetings or produce certain documents. Now these meetings and documents may be helpful, but to make them the actual definition, I think completely misses the point. It's certainly possible to produce high quality software without them and low quality software with them. So long story short, I didn't see anything that I liked, nor that was commonly accepted. So in the spirit of XKCD, I decided to roll my own. But rather than taking the best of every one of the ones that already existed, as so many of these new competing standards do, I tried to keep it simple. And to do that, I zoomed out from down in the weeds where we developers tend to live up to about low Earth orbit. So I could look at continents, not pebbles. And that let me pare it down to a list of just six aspects with simple names and well, relatively simple explanations. And the list is so short that even with a very basic explanation, it fits on the back of a business card, and this is mine to prove it. See me afterwards if you want one as a cheat sheet. I call this list of aspects acrumen. So what does that mean? Originally, it was a Latin word meaning sour fruit, such as grapefruits, limes, and of course, especially lemons. And that's why 
You'll see so much bright screaming lemon yellow throughout these slides. That's the official color of Acromen. But what is Acromen in this context? The acronym Acromen, try saying that 10 times fast, just takes those aspects and puts them in priority order. So by now you're probably wondering, what are those dang aspects already? And they are that software should be appropriate, correct, robust, usable, maintainable, and efficient. So what does all that mean? First of all, it needs to be doing what the stakeholders need it to do. In other words, do the right job. But then it needs to be doing that job correctly. In other words, do the job right. It should be hard to make the software malfunction or even seem to. And I know that sounds a little strange. I'll delve deeper into that along with all the others a little later. But on the other claw, it should be easy for the users to use and for the developers to change. The other way around, not so much. And lastly, dead last, despite how much we developers tend to worship this, it should go easy on resources. So what does the N stand for? Where's the N? Nothing, I just tacked that on to make a real word. <clears throat> Now, while that's all fresh in our minds, I'm going to answer a couple of frequently asked questions. First off, aside from going in detail on the list of tips, how to achieve it, how do we just use Acromen itself, the raw list of aspects? Mainly, we can keep it in mind as sort of a checklist when either writing or evaluating software. We can ask, is it appropriate? Is it correct? And so on. And how good is it in each aspect, be it on a scale of 1 to 10 or just by simple triage? Or at least, you know, is it good enough for our purposes? And if not, we can ask what can be done to make it so. And we can also set, uh, ooh, in the short term, we can ensure that our projects are going to meet these criteria. And in the long term, we can ensure that our processes support these criteria by including helpful activities and perhaps even an explicit evaluation against these criteria. We can also set targets for how good we need the system to be in each of these areas. <clears throat> Another frequent question is, is Acrumen, or rather Acrum, always the correct order? And the answer is no. Acrum is just the typical case. Your mileage may well vary. Con consider something like a company internal command line physics simulation tool using a standard formula that's never going to change. I'll spare you all the reasoning, but its list may look more like this, Acrum rather than a croom. The only constant is that appropriateness will always be at the top. And we'll soon see why, because now I'm going to del delve more closely into each aspect. And up first is, of course, appropriateness. If our software doesn't have this, then nothing else matters. If our software is doing the wrong job, it doesn't matter how well it's doing the wrong job. So appropriateness is not only more important than any one of the others, but even more important than all of the rest of them put together. And to prove the importance of being earnest, I mean appropriate, let's try a little thought experiment. Suppose you want a program to play checkers and I write for you the world's greatest chess playing program. It's as correct, robust, usable, maintainable, and efficient as anyone could ever possibly want. But are you going to be happy with it? Probably not. But why not if it's so great? Because it's not checkers. It's not what you ask for. It's not what you need. In Acrumen terms, it's not appropriate. 
So how do we achieve appropriateness? In an ideal world, we would have frequent direct contact with the stakeholders to ask them questions and get feedback. Unfortunately, in this world, we don't usually get that opportunity. Frequently, not even substitutes like requirements analysts and business analysts and so on. So we usually have to settle for occasional, remote, indirect contact with a representative of some stakeholders, like a product owner in Scrum or something like that. It's not quite as good, but having occasional communication with somebody with a clue about the stakeholders' needs is vital. Once we think we have a decent grasp on their needs, we can show them mock-ups and prototypes of what we intend to do and demos of what we have done. And this gives them a chance to correct our wrong impression of their needs before we go too far down the wrong rabbit hole. Anybody ever been there wasting time implementing the wrong thing? Yeah, I'm seeing some nods out there, a couple of hands. But there's another thing that I'll be returning to over and over in this talk. We can propose tests. And in particular, I like the given when then format. Given these preconditions, when this happens, then this is the result. And this makes a great link between the worlds of business and technology because usually they can understand it pretty well if we've phrased it in their language and we can turn it into a runnable test. Our next aspect is correctness. Now, nothing can actually stop us from writing incorrect code, at least with the tools we have these days. But that just means the big question is that, like the thermos that keeps hot things hot and cold things cold, how do we know? And as you probably realize, tests let us know whether or not our software is correct. Assuming, of course, that the tests themselves are correct, but that's a story for another day. Now, I'm going to skip over a lot of advice you can probably find elsewhere about how many tests are right, of what kind, and so forth. But I'll point out that the usual kind of tests that we typically encounter, like unit tests, feature tests, end-to-end -end tests, and so forth, can only test the scenarios that we thought of to test. But there are some advanced tools that can help find the edge cases, such as property-based testing and mutation testing. And I also speak on that at conferences. Uh, you can find some of my videos on YouTube. So we should have enough test coverage of assorted kinds and levels and verified to be actually meaningful. That's one of the things mutation testing is really good for. To have actual strong confidence in the correctness of our code. And next up we have robustness. The short explanation is that it's hard to make it malfunction or even seem to, but what does that mean? There are a few other things, but most of what I mean is actually covered by a core concept of information security, the CIA triad. Now, it's nothing to do with spies and gangsters. It's this triangle here of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So robust software does not reveal information when it's not supposed to, alter information when it's not supposed to, or become unavailable when it's not supposed to even if someone is trying to force it to do those things. So how do we achieve all that? Again, we could bring in the experts. In this case, that would be penetration testers, or pen testers for short. You can see why I couldn't resist that image. But they're expensive and usually disruptive because they need to test the production system. So again, we'll usually have to deal without the help of the experts, but we can go pretty far by using some of their tools, including software like static analyzers and fuzzers and probes. But that's only covering actual fragility. What about seeming fragile? For that, we must adopt some of their mindset, not just their tools, 
and ask ourselves, what could go wrong? For instance, if the system wants a user to type a file name, the user could type it wrong. We've all made typos, right? Or they could type correctly the name of a file they don't have proper permission to read or write or whatever we're trying to do. As implied before, the program should not crash, but it also should not show an obscure error message like enoent or HTTP 500. You know, typically users, no clue what either of those mean. And a stack trace is right out. Instead, it should show a reasonably clear and friendly error message. Let the user try again if possible. And in short, our software should handle all reasonably foreseeable problems as gracefully as practical. Our next aspect is one often seen as a trade-off with security, usability. Hard to use software can not only cause headaches, but even lead the user to do the wrong thing. Does anybody remember what happened in Hawaii in January 2018 due to some hard to use software? I see some nods out there. For the rest of you, they had a false alarm about an incoming nuclear missile. Can you imagine what would happen if that software were controlling not just the alarm system, but our launch system? Not good times would ensue. Unfortunately, if we Google software usability, we mostly find things about making sure that people with assorted challenges can use the software about as well as the rest of us. In other words, accessibility. Now that's a great goal in and of itself, but I'm adding on that it should be easy for everyone to use, not just equally difficult. Now, granted, the users may be facing some challenges, and we can start with the ones that accessibility usually addresses, like low vision, or color vision, or hearing, or fine motor control, to use a mouse, or whatever. But there are whole other types of challenges that we should be aware of. Like they may be lacking literacy, at least in our character set, or cultural knowledge, or even intelligence. Yes, we may joke about stupid users, but statistically, about half of them will be below average. This is not Lake Wobegon Middle School. So how do we achieve all of that? Once again, ideally, we can bring in the experts. Like ideally, a user experience expert, or at least user interface expert, or at the very least a designer, even an old-fashioned print graphic designer, would be useful. But again, we'll usually have to do without their help. But we can go a long way using some of their principles. For instance, here we see an example of the KISS principle. I think some of us would recognize our own work in that cluttered, unusable mess at the end, directly violating the principle of keep it simple, stupid. Also, it may not be as quantifiable and definable as something like correctness, but a user interface can still be tested. We can bring in some of our typical users, assign them a task to try to accomplish with our software, watch as they're trying to do it, watch their screens and faces and so forth, and see what they're having trouble with, fix their pain points, maybe do more of whatever they actually like about our software. Oh, wow. The next aspect is the one we probably usually think of most, maintainability. And we'd probably all agree that the idea is that maintainable software is easy to change. Thank you, Captain Obvious. But I'm going to add on that it should be easy to change with low chance of error. We don't want a dicey situation. And low fear of error even for a novice programmer who is new to our team. So how do we achieve all that? For better or worse, the vast majority of software engineering advice is aimed squarely at this. So rather than expound on 
lots of generic principles like YAGNI and SOLID and so on. I'm going to just return to my main theme and tell you how testing can help with maintainability. The old tests from any previous bug fixes, feature additions, and so on, form a regression test suite that acts as a safety net to catch anything that used to work and that we just broke. Just knowing that that is there will let us proceed at a quick pace with a clear and focused mind. I think I can, I think I can. Rather than creeping along slowly and carefully because we're terrified we're gonna break something and not discover it until the users start complaining. And that speed up is why I mention fear at all. And for the final aspect, software should be easy on resources. In other words, it should be efficient. Mainly we know about technical resources like the classic RAM and CPU and the trade-offs between those. But also these days, bandwidth is also a frequent concern. And lately, one of the ones I've seen wasted prodigiously is screen space, don't get me started. But there are, again, other kinds of resources we need to be aware of, like the user's patience and brain power and the company's money. So how do we achieve efficiency? Now, just like there are many kinds of resources we could be inefficient with, there is many kinds of inefficiencies even with each of those. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to focus on one for now. And that's the usual one we think of and the most obvious, slowness. I bet most of us have had the experience that we run our program, maybe even for the first time, we notice it's kind of slow. So we stare at the code, spot where we think it's being inefficient, spend a long time tweaking that one little spot, run it again, and it's still slow. Right? Anybody been there? Yeah, seeing a lot of nods. Okay. Well, don't do that. Measure it instead. Humans aren't really very good at spotting the inefficiencies, but there are packet capture programs and profilers and all kinds of other tools that will tell us exactly where, or at least when, we're using too much RAM and bandwidth and CPU and so forth. And then we can track down the root cause, fix it, and slap a performance test around it. You knew I had to mention testing again eventually. And that will help prevent, or at least help us spot, that kind of regression. So in conclusion, if we remember to make sure that our software is appropriate, correct, robust, usable, maintainable, and efficient, then nobody should have any cause to be sour about the fruits of our labor. Thank you.